So last time we were talking about genome editing and genome engineering, and we had just started to get into the topic of CRISPR-Cas9, um, the, mo the most modern and sophisticated class of genome editing tool um, after we had reviewed zinc fingers, talons, um, and made our way to, to this kind uh, of nuclease. So we're still in the category of nucleases generally and um, explained a little bit about how uh, targeting works for this nuclease um, based on uh, a protein that can be used universally to assemble with a guide RNA that then directs it to a particular region. And that's different than we saw with our other nucleases where they were fused to protein domains, where the proteins told uh, the nucleus where to make a cut. So as we're talking uh, about um, CRISPR-Cas9 in the context of metabolic engineering, that's actually not been its major area of use, but it does have ramifications for metabolic engineering. And I think as we cover genome engineering and genome editing, tools, it's important to understand, well, why is CRISPR-Cas9 such a big deal for all of biotechnology at large, but maybe less of a big deal for metabolic engineering? And if that's the case, then what is re more relevant for metabolic engineering? Well, so connecting with, you know, over this lecture and the next lecture, you will see more connections with topics like metabolic flux analysis and um, synthetic gene circuits and regulation. Um, this is kind of where, where it can all come together in terms of implementation. The ability to cut um, or target DNA sequences within the genome affords one the opportunity to activate, repress, delete, and insert genes. And so you can think of pretty readily how all of those functions are useful for metabolic engineering. Um, and that's kind of illustrated here. Um, so in, from this paper, you know, you have your usual metabolic pathway map motivating how you can go from renewable substrates to products, which we've talked about extensively. And here you've got the development of this CRISPR-AID strategy, where the AID each uh, stand for activation, inactivation, and deletion. So... Um, in terms of how this works, uh, what you want for activation um, or inactivation repression is you want the Cas9 to behave more like a transcription factor, which is, which is pretty neat. So if we go back to our biosensor construction principles, we know that there were repressors that bind specific operator DNA sites, and that when they're bound to DNA, there's no ability for an RNA polymerase to come through and start transcription. So instead of having a transcription factor rely on its particular, you know, operator DNA binding site, you can just have a Cas9 protein or any protein uh, that you could program to bind but not cut DNA. And then that will sterically block um, RNA polymerase from performing transcription. Or you can position the uh, binding site nearby and fuse an activator domain that might help recruit, for example, a sigma factor or some other transcription machinery. Um, and so we went over all of those principles uh, recently, so I won't cover those at great detail. The key to understand here is that there's just a single, um, I, I think it's one actually, it might be two, um, uh, substitutions that you have to make in the Cas9 protein in order to make it uh, deficient at doing the cutting. So Cas9, you know, it's got these different regions and, uh, and you could consider them different domains and the nucleus domain will have uh, at least one key catalytic residue that's required for breaking the DNA bond. And so if you substitute that amino acid, now you still get the binding to DNA based on what guide RNA you have, and you just don't get 
And so you can see then how that can be used for activation or repression. And of course, if you maintain the CRISPR um, nuclease activity, <laughs> you get um, cuts programmed where you want. Uh, and then um, you can, I think as this is showing uh, with these symbols here, um, exchange your, um, your particular DNA cassette uh, or if you're trying to do a simple knockout, maybe you use an antibiotic resistance marker um, so that when you flank it with homology to the region in the locus where you made your cut, you now have an antibiotic resistance gene if you successfully made your cut, and then you can select for the, the presence of that. And I think we're going to talk about selection more later. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned last time with all of these genome engineering strategies is you've got to do targeting. There's different mechanisms of how they combined the DNA. And then you've got to have a way to enrich or select or screen. Um, and, and so you'll see that being done differently. So uh, this one of the best things about having a universal protein that can be programmed with different guides and in fact, just have many copies of itself within the protein and many different guides, is that this affords you combinatorial uh, uh, approaches. Of course, um, one thing that you, one limitation with this particular strategy is if you have a Cas9 protein that's nuclease deficient and tethered to an activation domain, then you can combinatorially activate as many proteins as you want. But you can't, with this strategy, combinatorially activate, repress, and delete within a single strain. Uh, you would just need too many different types of Cas9 proteins, and they would all recognize the same guides. So that would be uh, a challenge there. Um, and so here you can see um, you know, an illustration of a combinatorial strain library. This seems to depict yeast, um, high throughput screening. Uh, probably based on the production of some metabolite, and then that's how you get your optimal strain, uh, optimal cell factories. So um, the example that we just showed involved yeast, and CRISPR-Cas9 has had such a big impact across all kinds of eukaryotes, um, mammals, zebrafish, worms, um, all kinds of other platforms of biological relevance. But in bacteria, well, there were a lot of ways to do genome engineering in certain organisms. There's still many for which doing any kind of engineering is very challenging. Uh, but one of the, the difficulties associated with using Cas9 is that it creates this double-stranded break. Or we saw we could make it, engineer it to just bind and not cut but that's not very useful. Um, you could also, something that I haven't mentioned yet, and may not have in the slides, is that you can um, engineer it to make just a cut of one of the strands of, of double-stranded DNA rather than both. Uh, that version is called a nickase because um, it's making what we call nicks. Um, in any case, uh, double-stranded breaks are lethal in bacteria and one can actually take advantage of that attribute um, by using Cas9 um, rather than as a, a means of, of trying to, um, well, rather than as a means of trying to necessarily make cuts and changes, uh, it can be used to provide some kind of selective pressure, some, kind, uh, some form of screening. Uh, it can also be used to make cuts. Um, but one uh, idea here is that, you know, you have, and this is from AdGene, a plasmid repository, um, you can transform your strains with Cas9 um, and a particular CRISPR guide. Um, you can try to use a single-stranded DNA repair template for where you want to make your mutation, and maybe you use Cas9 to create a cut there along with some other machinery, uh, which we'll talk about soon, um, called recombineering. And so it is true that the uh, targeted cut can increase 
your recombinating efficiency, but you might not need the targeted cut to actually help you do the DNA um, recombination uh, at the locus that you care about. Instead, what the Cas9 can help you do with the appropriate guide is find out whether or not you made that change. Because you can have a guide RNA that targets the wild type sequence. And if you've made a change, then you will not get a double-stranded cut at that region and that double-stranded cut, which is expected to be lethal. So this is the idea that if you have a successful recombinating, uh, then you have your, your CRISPR guide um, and uh, the guide RNA doesn't match the genomic sequence and so you don't get a cut. Um, whereas if you don't get a change being made in your genome, uh, then you're gonna have the, the CRISPR guide uh, match up exactly with that uh, genomic DNA sequence that wasn't altered. You're gonna get a double-stranded break and it's gonna be lethal. So baked into this process is this idea that you can still use Cas9 and the expression of a guide sort of after the fact to help you figure out what changed. Um, and as I mentioned, you can introduce the Cas9 early and have it make a cut also to help maybe accelerate a change. Um, but we, what we wanna talk about is this idea of recombinating, which this framework is introducing as an alternative um, to nuclease-based genome engineering. And uh, that should be the rest of, of this discussion.